right here. There's Russ. There's Gina. They're hiding. If you get a chance, sometimes we go up to them, like give them a hug, a handshake, high five, because they do all this stuff. Um, take another second right now and look down the aisle at your teacher, whoever is there, and thank them. Give them a thumbs up, a wave. They don't have to bring you here. They don't have to, but they do. Um, when you leave here after, after we're done in this period, because I know you're going to have your phones away and off this entire time, text your parents or snap them or something, and thank them because they maybe contributed to this by being a booster. Um, I want to thank also the, the From Tech crew because if they didn't, we wouldn't have lights on right now. Like, you wouldn't be able to hear me. And then finally, as always, thank yourselves. Give each other a high five right now because you're being awesome. This wouldn't happen if you weren't here. All right. Are you ready? Yes. Are you ready? Yes. Okay. First up, it's me and Jace. Go ahead. Hi guys, I'm Mia, and this is a true love story that I wrote for the one that got away. <laughs> Pajama shorts, no bra, messy bun, and a retainer made up my attire that early, warm Saturday morning. Three sips into my delightfully cold orange juice, along with two bites of a lightly toasted bagel, when out of the corner of my eye, I saw him. He had been the focus of my attention for three years. I cannot argue the fact that to be obsessed with a boy for three long years might sound ludicrous, but trust me, if you knew him, you would understand. The way his wavy brown hair flowed in the early morning breeze and his muscular legs made him glide graciously throughout the neighborhood streets has always been my favorite sight. As he sprinted past our dining room window, I felt my heart beat faster and a thought rushed into my mind, where is he going? I dropped my bagel, the cream cheese making a white mess on the hardwood floor, and darted after him as if I were running to save a life. I gripped the door handle, throwing the cherry red door open, and yelled for him, hey, where are you going? He did not turn around, did not notice, maybe did not even hear me. Strictly on the road ahead, he looked determined to get where he was going as quickly as possible. For my part, I knew I was not going to let him get away this time. Yelling his name on repeat, I dared to hope he was going to stop, maybe even come back into my open arms. Never mistaken for a natural runner, I found myself pursuing him at a speed I did not suspect I was capable of reaching. As I breathlessly continued my pursuit, he abruptly halted at the peak of the intersection of Windsor and Clover. Suddenly, my heart started pounding twice as fast, and my stomach dropped into an oblivion, and just then, I realized he had caught a glimpse of her. Bella. This whole time he had been running to another girl. Undeniably, she was strikingly beautiful. Her jet black hair, unfailingly silky and smooth, looked almost midnight blue in the morning sun. She exuded infinite confidence, strutting up and down the driveway as if she honed the entire Macintosh neighborhood. She was aloof and seemingly disinterested in anyone other than herself, yet he adored her. Heartbroken and out of breath, I kept stomping up the hill until I got closer and our eyes met. His sprint slowly turned to a jog, and finally into a walk, and with the very last of my remaining energy, I leapt for him. At last, I had him in my possession, and I was never going to let him out of my sight. And sanity was finally restored, as I carried my 20-pound dog, Gatsby, safely back home. Thank you. <laughs> Up next is Megan Forrest. Hi. Um, so first and foremost, shout out to Mrs. Inks fourth period class. Yeah. Woo! Okay. This is my piece called Inside Infinities. I have a spot I like visiting, just in my free time or when I feel like I need to get away from everything else in my life. Secluded just outside my favorite road, next to I-90, lies an old corporate building. Before it was a hideout for me, it was a workplace for others working their boring AT&T jobs. They're giant parking garages, perfect for watching the sunsets on warm summer nights. Come autumn, the trees turn a bright red and make driving through the long winding roads through the complex feel like a colorful dream. 
The windows reflect all the light they can and make beautiful little squares of gold all throughout the buildings. However, due to a lack of people working or perhaps the lack of anyone who cared enough to attend to this old building, why would they, as there would be no one here to see their hard work, the whole place is overgrown with weeds and generally has a wild feel. Roads that used to be well paved and neat are now cracked, with plants pushing through, the, through to the surface as to say they belong there, no matter what. Roaming through this old abandoned building is like a portal to a world in the not so distant future. After all, sooner or later, we will run out of room, out of supplies, and the sun will burn out and we will be left with the, re with the remains of the genius we created. The architecture, the inventions, the advancements we pride ourselves so dearly on, but we humans will dissipate as if we never existed. Oddly enough, this slightly post-apocalyptic world tends to remind me of calculus of all things. You see, in calculus you deal in infinities, an infinite amount of space between the two, three, four lines are given and you must make sense of the infinities you find. I see this life, the one we're living right now, as part of that long stretch of humanity. As soon as I cross the borders into that old, old building. I'm transported along that line of infinity into a world so similar, yet so different from my own. I feel as though I'm thrust into the endless stretch of the future, one with no people, only what we choose to leave behind. Maybe future us will figure out that there is a planet with water and the building blocks of life far away and can sustain our fragile lives. We will send the best and the brightest there and leave the breast to die out. In that case, maybe that is our infinity, continued through our tiny selection of the best of humanity. And thus, our legacy persists. Here on Earth, however, after buildings crumble and cities fall, we are left with only our non-biodegradable plastic, the very thing discarded from our lips and hands on the daily as we continue our search for everlasting meaning through any means possible. Despite our best effort, even our trash will eventually dissolve in, into nothingness. The buildings we love to roam will waste away without a trace, roads gone and glass shattered. It won't matter because the people there to witness the beauty will have faded out of existence as well. Our very humanistic intellect, the same ones that built skyscrapers and empires, will fizzle out as the universe takes back what we borrowed for just an instant in time, reverting it back to the state of which we stumbled upon it. The complex ideas dreamt up by, it, by Einstein and Newton will cease to exist as the neurons that memorize them die off. Calculus will be a dead language. The limits of humanity as the world approach, approaches infinity, seemingly up, exploded upward with genius and civility, and in the blink of an eye will disappear from the clutches of our grasps, leaving us desperate to keep hold of what we've created in the endless battle against time. The life we live and the history we, rem we remember is a simple fuse, a match, struck against the pavement and its fire rages, if only for an instant before being extinguished. Let the fire rage, and leave the universe to dust away the ashes. And next, and next up is uh, Iris Coe. These are pretty controversial opinions, but they're also stories of my friends, and I'd also like to say hi and thank you to Ms. Gerber's class. <laughs> telling stories about my friends are fun, and telling those about myself are also exciting. But to me, stories of us are always the best ones. Generations have quoted Don't Judge a Book by its cover, starting from decades ago, but can people really say this is a true opinion? The answer is, no, not really, because we don't live in an ideal world. A utopia where flaws are a non-existent concept is foreign to us. I decided to write this in order to share the stories of those who hide from the world. One, the one thing I remember is sighing at the half-empty tube, vision blurring, blinking profusely to stay awake. I'm not a sad person, but sometimes I become sad. Suffering from loneliness, living with the family, but at the same time feeling as if I'm in an abandoned woodland almost as lonesome as me. The trees stand tall, but don't answer. Don't think, swallow. I feel more nauseous than usual, despite trying to hold it in. I cough up blood, I can barely walk. My ankles clinking together like wine glasses, except they fall and shatter. I shatter. Yet I weakly raise my head, 
because the people I know are non-believers. It's okay though, swallow. I'm not sure if the medicine's making me hallucinate or if it's just the pain itself. I can't grasp my thoughts. I can't even tell the, I can't even tell the difference between the, sea and the sea, between the sea and the ocean anymore, or the sky and the sea. Everything's in gray, gray scale now. Or maybe it's, that's how it's always been. Hold your tongue, swallow. My throat burns, but I listen to the voice because it's the only thing I can hear. Two, I smile whenever possible. I take every chance I have because I can't when I arrive home. I open the door and hear the familiar screeches along with the shattering of china plates. I should be used to this by now, but I just stare at my shoes. I shut out the commotion with the closed door, but even the door's hinges are ripped off and bent in uncomfortable positions. I kneel down on the cold cage, feeling desperate, but I already know the key is and has been long gone. The only thing I can do is cover my mother as she cowers in fear and sobs. At times like this, feet, at times like this, siblings feel more like strangers and parents feel more like enemies. I turn selfish, sensitive, hateful even. Really, I don't want to cause a commotion, but at times I have to swim back up to breathe. I look around, I'm surrounded by an endless ocean, and even in the daytime, the supposedly pleasant waves remain black. Three, I can't get over the past. I like to think I did, but did I really? The bitter world has also made me bitter in the same way, bullying those that are under me in the same way those students picked on me in my most vulnerable state. Everyone thought it was just a tease, but would that still be true if I'm breaking apart from it? I try finding my way out of misery. I find home only to get pushed and talked down upon. I mention it later, but get scolded for being a liar. How can I not be a liar myself when everyone around me is? I turn another way through the maze towards my room, my place of tranquility, but even that's taken away from me. People at school would ask about my red scars and question my mentality, but you did this to me, I think. I take another route. This time it's my grandmother's town. She was strictly religious, and my, mo and my mother and my father were a skeptic for such foolishness. I was pulled back and forth often between the two. Don't pull me, I thought. I'm a person, not a rope. I can't say anything though. Fear of being hated made me silent like the moon. The moon. The moon comes out every day at night, alone in the open space, only to have people sleeping on its beauty. But it never stops doing its job. The moon doesn't need compassion to exist. The moon is strong unlike me. I want to be like the moon. Some ask why such a young teen as myself would write such controversial topics. It's because everywhere there's all these people that will say stuff like equality is within reach. But then why does bias still exist in so many minds? One of these uncertainties are the concerns of young adolescents. When teenagers try to express worries, grown-ups seem to take it much more lightheartedly than they should. Depression and suicide rates are soaring right now. It's the second lead leading cause of death uh, of those between the ages of 10 through 24. My point is, I feel everyone's voices should be heard, regardless of whether they, they're good or bad. I couldn't write everyone's stories, but not all my friends have the ability to communicate their sorrow, and that's why I wanted to write the story about us. Uh, the next one going up will be Kun Sang. Shout out to Miss O'Dee's fourth period class. Oh, yeah! Also, shout out to all the free thinkers out there. This one's for you. Yeah! Is a hot dog a sandwich? <laughs> this profound question was originally brought up as a simple joke between friends, but it soon became evident that there were some ignorant fools among us. You see, the popular belief at the time was that a hot dog could never be a sandwich because the composition of its components were fundamentally different than your traditional sandwich. Think about it. A hot dog has tubular meat wedged in the split of a single roll, whereas a sandwich has filling place between two distinct, separate pieces of bread. Therefore, since a hot dog did not consist of two separate pieces of bread, 
How could you in the right mind call that a sandwich? Well, upon further research on dictionary.com, <laughs> we discovered that the definition of a hot dog explicitly, explicitly mentioned that it was a sandwich, and that the definition of a sandwich included a subtle sub-definition that allows sandwich-like foods, like hot dogs, to be called sandwiches as well. I was shaken to my core. <laughs> this revelation fundamentally challenged my perspective of the world around me. But even though my horizons were broadened and the world was made ever more complex, there was an innate fear within me that refused to accept it as truth. My own perspective was too deeply rooted, too familiar in my mind to let go so easily. So, confronted with this vulnerability in my own psyche, I doubled down by instinct. Hot dogs look too different, they feel too different, they taste too different, they have to be different. But as I continue screaming about how the dictionary wasn't a reputable source, <laughs> doubt began, began to spout in my mind, and I began to ask myself, why? Why do I say I'm right, and why do I say they're wrong? Why am I compelled to reject the truth? Why is it so hard to accept? As I began picking through my excuses one by one, I slowly began to realize that I really had no reason to be so stubborn. I mean, I don't even like hot dogs. <laughs> but yet, there was this feeling within me that hated the idea of being wrong. Somehow, it felt like there was almost a shame in that failure. But the irony is that the more time I spent trying to appease that feeling, the deeper I dug myself into that failure. We're all stupid. We all make mistakes. Remember fidget spinners? <laughs> no one is perfect, so why should we always expect perfection in everything? If I had only known then, I might have been able to let go of my prejudices and enjoy a new universe of hot dog sandwiches. But instead, I trapped myself in my own freshly dug grave, unable to move on and slowly finding myself being ridiculed as hot dog boy. <laughs> Don't be like hot dog boy. <laughs> Don't plant your feet into the ground. Don't dig your own grave. Instead, take that first step. It's okay to be wrong. It's okay to make mistakes. Just keep walking forward. Don't let yourself be tied down with the shame of failure. It doesn't matter how much you trip or stumble, you're still moving forward. I stumble a lot coming up to this point, but it's through those experiences that I can take them in stride and confidently admit now that to my ignorant friends, the ignorant fools that I myself am an ignorant fool. Hot dogs are in fact sandwiches. Thank you. <laughs> Next up is Stevie Stronka. All right, I'm apologizing in advance for how I'm about to bring the mood down. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. It's nothing about hot dogs, unfortunately. Uh, being a typical teenager in 2019, you think you have it all figured out. You think your teen age should be the top priority in everyone's lives. I felt like this too, with those same, the world revolves around me kind of issues. As a sophomore, I was too preoccupied with succeeding in all my classes and having strong bonds with people. I was so cautious not to harm any of my friendships and I would be so, so devastated over every fight and bad grade, and it got to the point where that was all my life would revolve around. I was so absorbed with trying to be my best self, which led me to the point where I would wake up early every morning to do my makeup and curl my hair and get all dolled up simply to come to school, like, as Mrs. Kohler says it, an Instagram model. <laughs> I believe these minor inconveniences of getting bad grades and being disliked was all there was to life until I realized just how much more is really out there. It all began on February 12, 2018, a day that I will surely remember for the rest of my life. I woke up that day with insane amounts of swelling in my neck and my face, and I immediately went to the, went to the emergency room and waited for hours upon hours until roughly 8 o'clock that night when the doctor on call came into my room to break the news that I had an abnormality in my chest and that it appeared to be lymphoma. In all honesty, I didn't know what that was, but my mom and my grandma started crying, so I knew it must be bad. Within 20 minutes, my brothers, my sister, and my cousin were all at my side, hovering over me and reassuring me that everything would be fine, but I was still in shock and denial. I didn't know what would happen, but my grandma told me I should hug my little brother goodbye because it would be a while before I would be able to see him again. That same day from the emergency room, I was lifted onto an ambulance and transported down to a hospital in the city that has honestly become my second home. 
I spent that night and the next day in the intensive care unit, and that was where I got my official diagnosis of stage three non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. I was shocked and confused, and I already knew everyone else was sad, so I didn't want to make it worse by crying as well. It wasn't until I was alone with my mom that I realized just how serious it was. My mom was laying next to me in my bed, and she played Landslide by Fleetwood Mac, since this song has always provided a sense of comfort for us. My mom felt that in that moment, it was something that we both needed to hear. It's a song that I've heard a million times, but this time, every lyric had a new meaning. My first hospitalization lasted two weeks, and within those days, I had lost 20 pounds. I started chemotherapy the day after my diagnosis, and I was warned then that I would lose all my hair in one week's time. Chemo was excruciating in general, but the biggest heartbreak for me was losing my hair that was so long that it went down to my waist. I was truly dedicated to my hair, and the idea of losing it all within a week was taunting. My hair was always a security blanket for me. It was something I would always find comfort in when I felt insecure or when I didn't look my best. My hair fell out slowly at the beginning, a single strand at a time. When I would wake up and get out of bed, I would catch my mom trying to discreetly pick the hair that I was losing off of my pillow. It wasn't until March that my hair really started falling out. I remember so vividly sitting in front of my mirror in my bedroom, brushing my long hair and watching masses come out effortlessly. I got so fed up that I started ripping through my hair and pulling out as much as I could because I just couldn't stand watching it come out slowly or finding strands stuck to my shirt or covering my bed. It was at this time, too, that I got to see my friends for the first time since being diagnosed. I was at one of my closest friend's house, and my hair was falling out so profusely that I started apologizing to her for getting my hair everywhere. I felt silly, but I also felt insecure. I felt frail from losing so much weight, and I could hardly walk from her kitchen to her bedroom without passing out. But I was just so happy that I even got to see them again. I truly feel so lucky to have such incredible friends that stayed by my side through everything. They understood that at the beginning, I couldn't go many places or walk around or even stand for too long. So they would just lay in bed with me and talk for hours and hours upon, about what I missed at school or funny things I just missed within our friend group. I received chemo for a total of three and a half months which may not seem like a lot, but to have to lay in a bed for a week at a time and get such harsh chemicals pumped into your bloodstream at a rapid pace was pretty overwhelming. Thankfully, in August, I went into remission. I'm so proud of myself, and I feel as though that will forever be one of my life's greatest achievements. Through the hospital and local organizations, I was able to meet dozens of other teenagers who had also gone through cancer. One story that really shocked me came from my friends Lily and Bailey. They are twins who had both been diagnosed with leukemia within two years of each other. Uh, they told me that they're lucky to have a twin who was with, sorry, <laughs> they're lucky to have a twin who went through the same exact like diagnosis and care and treatment plan and all of that. Uh, another friend of mine, whose name is Chris, had lost his father before being diagnosed. We were on the, the phone one night and he told me how much he loved his father and that the only reason he still goes for his monthly chemo session was so that he could go on to live the life his father couldn't. Chris would also tell me about how every day at four in the morning he would play Monopoly with his nurses, which truly just makes me laugh. It makes me realize that even though having cancer was the worst thing that ha ever happened to me, I learned so many new things, made so many new friends, and I've made so many new memories. As much as I hate to say it, I'm grateful that the universe chose me to fight this battle. Cancer taught me that the small annoyances like bad grades and friend drama aren't the end of the world. It taught me that I can get through anything with the right mindset and the right amount of determination. I love being able to educate people about it, what it's like to be a teenager and experience things that no single person should ever have to go through. I'm grateful for everyone who loved me and supported me through it all and helped me keep my head above water even when I really just wanted to give up. My newfound strength is my best quality and I will forever cherish it and share it with my peers to help them get through their stressful lives and hopefully I'll be able to teach them that the little things don't make or break them. It's what you choose to put out into the world that will help you become the best version of yourself. Thank you. Okay, next up is Unmold Desai. Hi guys. So I wrote this uh, for Writers Week about something that I kind of deal with every single day, uh, my name. So rickshaws are a really popular form of public transport in India, and usually rickshaw drivers will decorate the back windows of their rickshaws with decals like we do on cars here. So sometimes they'll have like a religious quote, or maybe a picture of a Bollywood star, or baby era Justin Bieber. <laughs> and sometimes they'll have the names of their kids in fancy fonts. Now, the day I was born, my dad was out of town, and he had to drive a couple hours to get to the hospital. It was pouring that day, and he had to drive a car, and a bridge had broken down, so he ended up stuck in traffic for eight hours. And while he was stuck in traffic, he had a rickshaw in front of him. And the rickshaw said, Anmol, 
Now, my parents were struggling to think of a name for me, so I'm guessing it was the severe circumstances of, of the situation that led him to think, huh, that's not a bad name. <laughs> Fast forward four years, I had just moved to the States, and it's my first day of kindergarten. The teacher walks up to me and says, hi, what's your name? And I answer, Anmol. And she says, Anmol? <laughs> no, Anmol. Anmol. <laughs> I choose not to correct her this time. Over the course of the day, her pronunciation gradually changes from Anmol to Animal. <laughs> which, in hindsight, is pretty funny. But when you're five years old and everyone calls you Animal, it kind of sucks. And the thing is, I had no idea what was going on. My entire world had been flipped upside down. I didn't speak or understand much English, and every single person around me, every single thing was different. So two hours into the school day, my natural reaction to this confusion is to cry. And I don't mean a couple tears, I mean my eyes steam up, my face turn com turns completely red, and I start bawling and I do not stop. Not when the other kids stare at me, not when I see them whispering to each other, and not when the teacher takes my hand and leads me to a large purple beanbag chair and tells me, this is the timeout chair. And she tells me that I can't get up from this timeout chair until I stop crying and choose to join in on the class activities. So I don't get up. This becomes a regular cycle for the next two weeks. I'm always anxious about going to school, and when I am in school, I cry for a while on the timeout chair and go back home. And I want to tell my teacher that I don't know what's going on, and I just need some help, but I am literally incapable of doing so. So the cycle continues. One day, I'm sitting on the timeout chair, as usual, and a girl comes up to me and says, hey, is your name really Animal? And if five-year-old me knew how to roll her eyes, she would have rolled her eyes. I say, no, my name's Enmo. And she says, huh, that's a nice name. And from that day on, we did everything together, to the point where the teacher called us glue sticks. She spoke Hindi, so if I didn't understand something, she would explain it to me. We liked playing the same games, had the same favorite foods, and turns out we were also neighbors. Now that I think about it, in other ways, we were completely different. She was the shortest person in class, I was the tallest. If you had a problem with her, she would punch you. If you had a problem with me, I would apologize. She was confident and outgoing, and she helped me find my place when I understood nothing. The first day we met was the first day I stopped crying when I went to school. Now when someone says my name wrong, instead of getting annoyed or pissed off, I smile. Because I know he's given me one of the most important people in my life. My best friend. Thank you. <laughs> Next up, we have Katie Larson. <laughs> Shout out to Miss Ang's fourth period English class. Yeah. Um, so first off, I'd like to say this piece is completely fictional. Nothing in this piece actually happened in real life. Okay, please remember that. Um, okay. I shouldn't have painted my walls red. I did something very, very bad because my walls are red. It's ironic, isn't it? My mother told me that I shouldn't paint my wall such an angry color. But because she told me not to, I painted them anyway. Honestly, I didn't care much for the color then. I just did it out of teenage spite. Since I'm an idiot, I didn't listen to her and I surrounded myself with the color. Seeing it every day, I began to crave that color. That scarlet had slowly become my fantasy. I'd sit on the floor staring up at it every day. I didn't need anything else other than red in my life. It became my life. 
the only beauty that existed in the world, I needed it. I chose to paint my walls that color. The walls took over me, looming constantly. I chose the color, but it's the wall's fault that I became obsessed with crimson. My decision to paint my walls made them turn me into a monster. Why did my walls have to be red? This all happened because of that stupid decision. I didn't plan on doing this. I was completely normal before my mistake. All the kids in my class liked me. Sure, they didn't talk to me at all, but that's just because they've been playing the silent game with me since the second grade. One time, this new girl even smiled at me. Then the other kids told her to stop talking to the psycho girl. They called me that. Not because I was crazy or anything, just because I ripped all the heads off the story time stuffed animals. It was really fun, and I'm sure every kid wanted to do it. I just did it before them. See, I wasn't crazy before my walls turned me like this. Every day, I just stared up at my walls, craving more and more and more of that color. I eventually found some relief when I let it pour out from within me. I drew pictures and wrote phrases along my arm just so the color was twice as intoxicating. I would just sit in silence watching the color run down my arm and seep into whatever piece of furniture I resided on. I couldn't walk into my room without staring at my walls just needing more of it. So I dig into my arms begging for every drop. I didn't mind hurting myself. The satisfaction I felt from its power was strong enough to distract me from the pain. I didn't regret my actions, so I didn't regret painting my walls red. But now I really regret my decision. Because of my walls being that color, I did something to hurt someone else. So I did something that I cannot undo. That color overcame me. What I did was not my fault. I'm not crazy or weird. I swear I just did that because of that horrid color. It came to a point in which my obsession was too uncontrollable. My own body just wasn't enough to appease my obsession. I craved more and more and more of the red. Those walls made me do it. Made me need more. Put the idea in my brain. Called me to grab the knife. And told me to shove the knife directly into my mother's neck. The red gushed from her. She collapsed onto the floor. At first, it was the most satisfying thing in the world. I dipped my hands into the puddle, feeling its warmth coat my skin. I sat in awe of it. But then the puddle kept growing and growing. It was far more red than I'd ever expected. It was too much, and suddenly I felt overwhelmed. Scared and frantic, I got up as quickly as possible, only to be knocked down by instantaneously as a wave of nausea passed over me. I couldn't look down at my hands or my mother without wanting to vomit. By one act, the spell was broken. Red was no longer my fantasy, but instead my worst nightmare. The thing that used to be my happiness has turned me into a monster. I killed my mother because of those walls. This is my fault for painting my walls that color. I'm so, so sorry, mother. I should have listened to you. Shout out to my mom, who's in the audience. <laughs> um, up next, we have Cameron Peckney. Yeah! Hold on, I gotta adjust the mic for a second. Okay, so I know it's a Monday and I know it's early, so you're probably feeling kind of tired, but I'm gonna make a joke or two and they're probably not gonna be funny, but your participation would be really appreciated. <laughs> hey guys, my name is Cameron, and for the five minutes I'm up here, I wanted to have a conversation with you. I know it may not seem like a very personal conversation with 500 of you and one of me, but for these five minutes, I decided I wasn't gonna be sharing a poem or a story or a song, but that I was just going to talk with you. 
not talk at you, but have a two-way conversation. And so, as every conversation starts, I gotta ask, how was your day? Good, right? It's pretty cool. You got to relax down here with your English class and listen to all of these incredible people talk. You may be even one of them yourself. One of the things I personally love the most about Writers Week is that anyone can get up here. It can be someone with an insane voice or best friends doing a slam poem or someone that will make us all roll over with laughter. But as different as everyone may seem, each person shares something. Each person shares a little bit of themselves. They show a little bit of vulnerability. And that is exactly what I wanted to talk with you guys about. Vulnerability is a funny thing. I tend to think of it like the high dive at a swimming pool. You're at the top looking down, wanting to jump, but so afraid to step off. You can't exactly explain why, you just know that you are. In a similar way, we're all a little afraid of vulnerability. Being emotional, admitting wrongs, admitting love, these are some of the most freeing feelings. But when we find ourselves at opportune times to express them, what do we do? We peer over the edge and then climb back down the ladder. As high school students, there's a few things we're good at and a lot of things we still need to work on. This is why learning to embrace vulnerability at our age is so important, because after our time here, we'll have more responsibility. We'll have college exams and jobs and families and real love and real sorrow, and most of the time, we'll feel really lost. We cannot possibly take on this plethora of things if we do not know first how to handle them. To start, how many of you struggle to admit you're confused? Raise your hands. I'll even raise two. Physics this year got me really, really lost. We find ourselves in class most likely understanding a decent amount, but when we do homework or write essays, we blank. We need help. But what do we do? We don't ask for any. In our minds, admitting confusion is like handing in your smart card, as if being confused on one day of one lesson of one unit in one year of one subject means you're dumb. Newsflash, it doesn't. It doesn't matter what level classes you are in or what your SAT score is, you are all, in my mind, brilliant people. Admitting you need help is one of the strongest things you could ever do. It's as simple as that. Another thing we tend to hesitate with is receiving compliments. It's super random, I know, and it may seem easy with social media, but inversely, that has made it so much more uncomfortable in person. It's almost like saying thank you and stopping your day to internalize the compliment and believe it makes you full of yourself. There's a fine line between self-confident and narcissistic, and so many of us are afraid of crossing that line. This is when vulnerability steps in. Being able to look that person in the eye and say thank you so much, that made me really happy and then continuing on with your day is the first step. The second is being open enough with yourself to not feel ashamed of showing yourself the same love that that person showed you. Knowing in your mind that no matter what, deep down, there's a beautiful part of you, and using that as your motivation is a pivotal step to embracing vulnerability. Being vulnerable with yourself, accepting that you may have a bad hair day or you accidentally wore a grout fit to school, but remembering that as cheesy as it sounds, you are amazing and you are deserving. In order to feel love from others, platonic or otherwise, we must first express love to ourselves. There is no other alternative, there is no way around this. The love we give and the love we receive stems only from the love we believe we are worthy of feeling. As high school students, we should be emphasizing the importance of being wildly unafraid. Being okay with feeling lost, accepting our confusion, and acting out our love. No doubt it's hard, but I wanted to end my time with giving you a bit of your own to talk with a neighbor. Compliment them, make them laugh, admit something strange to them. Do something. Interact, laugh, and continue to do so until it comes naturally. Thank you. Wasn't that awesome? Let's get one more round of applause for that. And luckily we have time for a couple more pieces. So first up to share is Megan. Okay, so this kind of goes off of what Cameron was talking about because it's vulnerable and I'm nervous. 
It's also like not edited, so the kind. Um, this is kind of an extension of what I did last year. This is 18 things I learned in 2018. Number one, there are a lot of firsts that come with being 16. Most of these firsts will be in your top 10 moments of all time. Two, friends are always there, and sometimes you need to open up to get help for your stupid life problems. Number three, I learned that going to work drunk is not always a good idea. Sometimes not being able to see or walk is not really going to work, and I should just, you know, not do that. Number four, I learned that addiction is really, really hard. Number five, I learned that I have severe depression, or so the doctors at Alexian told me. I still think they might be wrong, but whatever. Number six, I learned that scars are harder to hide than I once thought, and so much more painful. Number seven, I learned that I'm not really who I thought I was. I was a cage around troubled emotions, and I was barely scraping by. Number eight, I learned everyone else was not who I thought they were. People who I thought would never leave left, and people who I thought couldn't believe would stay, stayed. Number nine, I learned that sometimes leaving is the best option, and good things aren't really here to stay. Number 10, I learned that tattoos don't make scars feel any better. Number 11, I, I learned that my addiction was getting worse, and number 12, I was getting worse. Number 13, I learned that maybe I didn't have to always be perfect all the time. Number 14, I learned that opening up is always a good thing, and that number 15, I talked to so many people about my problems, and that number 16, I learned that people will listen. And number 17, if you aren't talking to them right now, you will meet them later, and that finally, number 18, recovery is possible. I know I said I wasn't gonna share a poem, but here I am. Um, I wrote this for a friend at uh, three o'clock in the morning on Thursday, so that was fun. Um, she looked at me in one day and said, I think the reason we're so afraid to love is because we're even more afraid of getting hurt. And perhaps that is why children love so simply, because the naivety of, that comes with their age shades them from the epilogue of joy. I laughed at the, at the irony. How could it be that this enigma of a feeling is responsible for both bliss and despair? The fragility of it all is quite beautiful. After all, love is like art, and art brings you joy and me to tears, and there's no way to understand it, and yet we try anyway. I dreamt that night that I was a child. Okay. We have, uh, we have time for about one question. And I, I think I, I gathered it from some of my colleagues over there. Um, so we're gonna ask you guys, if you take a second, who are you looking forward to seeing most this week at Writers League? Is there one performer you're like, I cannot wait, I'm going to skip biology. No, I'm just kidding, don't do that. Okay, does anyone wanna start? Like, you're nodding your head right away, Cameron. Is there somebody you wanna see? Here, you know, we're, we're gonna, we'll pass it down. Um, it's, I mean, my best friend is performing next period. Uh, her name is Valeria Delgado. We should all, yeah, check her out, check her out, yeah. Uh, there's too many students to name, but everyone up here is extremely talented, so I'm all excited for them. I'm also really excited for Sierra de Mulder. I've been watching her for a while. Um, uh, Friday, eighth period, right? Yeah, okay. Yeah, I'm excited for her. I'm also really excited for Sierra Mulder. I uh, watched her TED Talk and it was really good. Um, I'm also really excited to see all my friends perform. Um, I know they'll kill it and do great, so. I'll be honest, I've not looked at the sheet yet. <laughs> But I'm sure they're all good, so I'm excited for that. Um, I mean, I'm just looking forward to the Chicago Raiders, and I, didn't, I don't exactly know their names, but hopefully I'll get to see them, and some of my friends are performing on later days, so yeah. 
I'm really excited to watch Morgan Miller. Um, I'm really looking forward to taking a bathroom break during physics and seeing one of my best friends perform tomorrow, or yeah, tomorrow during sixth period. Um, and then I'm also, of course, looking forward to fanboys because those are some pop and jams. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing Jamila Woods. I think she's here Thursday, 5th and 6th. I love her music, so. Let's give one final round of applause for our awesome students. And you guys did a great job too. Thank you so much, period four.